Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you all hear me well? I'm going to put these mics up. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ezekiel Dixon Roman, uh, faculty in the School of Social Policy and Practice, and welcome to the Control Society Speaker Series. This speaker series is co-curated by myself and Jessa Lingle, my good colleague, um, and who's also faculty here in the Annenberg School for Communication, um, and supported by a Provost Excellence Through Diversity Fund grant, the School of Social Policy and Practice, the Annenberg School for Communication, and the Price Lab for Digital Humanities. I'd first like to extend thoughts and condolences to the victims, family, friends, and loved ones of the Las Vegas shootings. Um, and I'll just leave it on that. Um, I'd like to provide and, and begin by providing a few words to frame the talks for this year-long speaker series and then introduce our speaker for today. The title of the speaker series, Control Society, is a, is a concept that French philosopher Gilles Deleuze developed in his 1992 essay, Postscripts on Societies of Control. This is Deleuze's reworking of Michel Foucault's disciplinary societies in order to account for the increasingly more networked societies that, since World War II, have begun to move beyond the organization of vast spaces of enclosure of disciplinary societies. In control societies, discipline is no longer based on the corporal disciplining and shaping of bodies via the awareness of the possibility of being visible by authorities of surveillance, Control societies is characterized by the hypervisibility across time and space and the regulating of movement and acts through time and space. As Deleuze states in control societies, the numerical language of control is made of codes that mark access to information or reject it. If disciplinary societies might be characterized by parametric modeling and population census data, and perhaps also associated with Foucauldian analyses of, of how such measures structure society, the latter, that is control societies, is characterized by a more invasive becoming statistic in which social metrics are actively mutated along with that which they measure. In Deleucean terms, this shift corresponds to a shift from the individual to a more environmental system of individuals, a term that designates the multiplicities of flowing traits and tensors that segment and differentiate all modernist conceptions of the individual and society. When we consider our vast amounts of digital technologies that have become taken for granted forms of quotidian social life, it becomes quite easy to see what Deleuze was speaking to almost 30 years ago. More importantly, the socio-technologies that make up our digital world are increasingly becoming part of the practices of governmentality and social policy, thus forming and shaping the architectures of societies and having implications to the reproducing or reconfiguring of difference. In other words, some have argued that more and more we are seeing software become the engines to societies where algorithms are doing the thinking. Each of the speakers throughout this year-long speaker series will be engaging in questions pertaining to the potential or ongoing implications of control societies, doing work on the intersections of computation and governmentality with a particular focus on the ways in which difference is being reconfigured reproduced or reconstituted in and through the computational acts of digital architectures. This brings me to have the esteemed privilege to introduce a renowned leading scholar of digital media, critical theory and algorithmic culture, uh, Alexander Galloway. Alexander Galloway is professor of media, culture and communication at New York University. He is a writer and computer programmer working on issues in philosophy, technology, and theories of mediation, and is author of several books on digital media and critical theory. These scholarly texts include Protocol, How Control Exists After Decentralization, Gaming, Essays on Algorithmic Culture, The Interface Effect, and most recently, a monograph on the work of Francois uh, Lerouillet, Please forgive me, my French is not the greatest. <laughs> um, titled uh, Le Rouillet against, against the Digital. Uh, professor Galloway was a visiting professor in 2012, um, in the spring of 2012, with us here at the University of, Pre of Pennsylvania. He will be giving a talk today on the golden age of analog. It's now. And without further ado, Alex Galloway. Thanks, uh, Ezekiel, and uh, also Jessa for um, inviting me here. Um, 
and it's good to be uh, back here at Penn, which was my uh, home away from home in um, 2012 for a semester. Um, and I, you know, I really was taken, quite taken by the theme of this conference series. Um, the, the sort of main theme, control societies, uh, which is something through the work of Gilles Deleuze that's been, that I've been obsessed uh, with for a long time. Um, so that really caught my attention, but also um, the, the, the third phrase, um, ontologies of difference. And so that's really the part of the, the series that I think I'm gonna focus on here, uh, but perhaps from a, a slightly different direction than, 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 um, than you might expect. Um, I'm teaching a seminar, doctoral seminar right now at NYU on the digital and the analog. So um, I will be returning to some kind of fundamental concepts and hopefully um, uh, some of you uh, might be more familiar with, with some of these arguments, um, uh, but, but hopefully I can reveal some, some aspects of them that um, are new to, to you, to all of you. So in thinking about the digital and the analog, I've been, been thinking a lot, in fact, about um, René Dormal's short, unfinished novel called Mount Analog. Um, or we could even render the title as The Analog Mountain. And in contemplating it, I've been trying to understand what he might have meant by the analog mountain in this novel. The novel discusses mountains in mythology, it mentions proportion versus scale, referring to the scale and inaccessibility of this mythical mountain. The mountain is a gateway between the visible and the invisible. The text laments an incurable need to understand. And indeed, Damal has some fun here around the question of understanding and language, for there is a character named Sogal that's the old Greek word logos in reverse, along with a housekeeper simply named physics. And as a reader, one, one longs for the impending arrival of someone named Sogolana, but alas, she never arrives. All thought is a capacity to grasp the divisions of a whole, wrote Domal in one of the novel's most elegant moments. The divisions of a whole of absolutely any kind. I wonder about the meaning of this passage. Is this line a hymn to the powers of thought? Or is it an admission that whatever the powers of the mind, there will always exist an excess of holes, holes that while always graspable, in their very graspability belie a fundamental separation? separation from thought. In a certain sense, Domal is summoning the original question of Greek philosophy, what is the logos? And what is the difference between logos and everything else that falls away from logos? Terms like analogy and analog all share logos as a common root, as do terms like logic, of course, um, and my favorite, um, logiciel, which is the French word for software, logiciel. A number of questions immediately spring to mind. What is the relationship between logos and analogos, analogy, analog? Are they opposite terms, or do they have a different relation? And if the analog's putative opposite is the digital, where does that put logos? are digital and logos synonyms. Digital and analog, what do these terms mean today? Um, this is a hard question, I think maybe a harder one than, than uh, it seems at first, first glance. Um, one common response to the question of the digital is to simply make reference to things like Twitter, PlayStation, computers. And I think here, in making these kinds of references, we might be correct, um, but maybe only correct coincidentally. For the basic order of digitality has not yet been demonstrated through mere denotation. And the second question, the question of the analog, is harder still, with responses often also consisting of mere denotations of things, sound waves, 
the phonograph needle, magnetic tape, a sundial, a wheel. At least denotation itself is analogical. But still, what's the answer? Shall we flip a coin, or better yet, roll the coin down the hall and let it land where it will? A number of contemporary authors have taken up the question directly. Recall how the first great Delizian in North America, Brian Masumi, once wrote an essay called On the Superiority of the Analog. And I shudder to think how badly he would be trolled online if he were to pen such an essay today. Even at the height of the first internet bubble, Masumi stayed true to his principles. He knew, uh, I, I had no grasp of this at the time, but he knew that to be a Delizian obligated one to embrace the analog fully, to become an analog philosopher. Still, Masumi was not shy about providing very clear definitions for the digital as well as the analog. For him, the analog is, quote, a continuously variable impulse or momentum that can cross from one qualitatively different medium to another, like electricity into sound waves or heat into pain, variable continuity across the qualitatively different continuity of transformation. The analog is thus a question of representation via continuous variation, but also a representation able to cross between qualitatively different entities or zones. And so the famous example, maybe infamous example from Dillas and Guattari is the, is the wasp and the orchid. The, the, orchid that has, the wasp that has landed on the orchid. By contrast, Masumi defined the digital as, quote, a numerically based form of codification, zeros and ones, a close cousin to quantification. Um, and he's much less po poetic when he defines the digital, which is maybe telling. But he defines them both accurately. These definitions will serve, uh, I think, nicely for us uh, for now, although we'll want to expand them. If computers, Twitter, and PlayStation are digital, it is because they operate using quantified symbols. And if waves, vinyl records, mag magnetic tape, sundials are analog, it is because they operate, use, operate using continuous variation across qualitative difference. Now, the word analog, as I hinted a second ago, is something of a doorway because it opens up and indicates a path forward. In its etymology, the word analog contains an answer to the question, at least the beginning of such an answer. Analog is formed from ana and logos, two Greek terms that themselves, I admit, are not entirely evident. Logos, in fact, is a common Greek term, even though it has a sort of hallowed uh, you know, aura among, among philosophers. Um, it's in fact a common Greek term. It contains a number of, 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 of different meanings, though, that don't necessarily map easily into English. So philosophers like Jacques Derrida have spent countless hours, uh, years even, plumbing the nuance and sophistication of uh, the term logos. In a day-to-day -day sense, logos means speech. I think this is often uh, forgotten, but it just means speech. So. When, when Socrates speaks to his interlocutor or listens to the speech of another. In each case, it is a question of logos as speech or as word. The famous phrase that opens the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, ends in its Greek rendering with the term logos. So it's literally in the beginning was the logos, or if you want to be very you know, kind of philosophically, you could render that line as um, at the foundation is the logos. Um, en arche en ha logos. So the term arche is actually uh, there as well, another important word for philosophers. Cognate with logos are, are Greek words like lego, to say, to speak, or um, logismos, 
which means accounting, counting, calculating, reckoning, reason, and from which we derive logic, logistical, in other words. So embedded here is the second important meaning of the word logos. Logos means speech, discourse, and word, but it also means ratio. And thus, by extension, rationality and reason. The connection between word and ratio might not be entirely clear, but consider the composition and delivery of speech, as in rhetoric, for example. To speak, and to speak well, means to speak in a way that is coherent, to speak in a way in which words form proper compositional arrangements. In a general sense, logos refers to order, proper order, particularly a sense of rational discursive order in speaking. But ratio also has a much more literal sense here. And there's a whole kind of uh, math uh, mathematical part to this story that I won't have time to go into today, but we could talk about in the Q&A if you want. Consider common mathematical ratios like 3 to 4 or 5 to 8, 3 quarters, 5 eighths. Or consider simple words like cat, bat, mat, in these examples, there exists a ratio composed out of elemental units. The ratio of three to four or five to eight is only made possible because of a pre-existing condition that the integers exist and that they may come into relation with each other. Ratio therefore relies on a, if you will, a kind of foundation of consistency that is furnished for it. Likewise, words like cat, bat, and mat, I mean, in fact, all, all words, are composed out of alphabetical elements that themselves have been defined explicitly in terms of their ability to be recombined into large words. So in this way, ratio, rationality, and word, and indeed logos overall, are thus a, a form of proper arrangement out of a foundation of symbolic consistency. And it's that, it's that the kind of almost um, homogenous substrate uh, that I think is very important here. Analogos is a bit different. First and foremost, the analog is not the negation or inversion of logos. I think that's a very important point to stress. The prefix ana is not the same as a or a, the, 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 the alpha privative um, used in terms like um, you know, atypical, atheist, where it's used as a, as a, as an, as a negation. That's not, that's not um, ana. The ana in analog does not negate logos, nor give a kind of contrapositive form, but in fact produces a different relationship, a kind of parallel or implicative relationship. Of course, if you, if you know the Greek prefixes, prefixes or, or, or prepositions, you know what ana typically means. It means up or upward, right? So ana is the opposite of kata, meaning down or downward. Thus, a katabatic wind is the wind that rushes downward, for instance, downward off of an icy glacier. And anabasis refers to the opposite kind of motion, a kind of upsurge or rushing in as in a phrase like the anabasis of desire made popular in the 1960s and 70s. But that's not the use of, of ana here. Analogos does not mean upward speech. As Pierre Chantrain reminds us in his Dictionary of Greek Etymology, ana can also have a kind of distributive value, meaning by reason of, or at the rate of, or in proportion to. And I think this begins to approximate the true meaning. Analogos means proportionate or comparable. Thus, analogos means literally proportionate with or according to a due logos. We might simply say that the analog is well proportioned or suitable. The Greek logos had no opposite 
wrote Michel Foucault in 1961. And many since have contemplated what he might have meant by such an, an assertion. For what so confounded Foucault in his first book, A Study of Madness, was the unspeakable nature of non-speech. The simple opposite of logos for the Greeks, of course, was a logos the, with the alpha privative. Not analogos, but a logos. These are the ones without speech, the brutes and animals, and most importantly, the child, the infant, right? Infant is from the Latin for unspeaking or without speech. So a logos is the, is the direct inversion of logos, you might say, and thus it means literally unreason or the irrational, non-reason, unreason, irrational, no, no ratio, right? But alogos is also an inversion of the very speech, the very word of logos, and thus alogos refers literally to speechlessness. So as Michel Serre put it, the alogon prohibits speaking. The alogos is mute, no word, no speech. Um, and if you know the story around rational numbers and, and irrational numbers, um, the irrational numbers are literally the, the numbers you cannot speak about. Um, they are the, the non-logos numbers. So again, what do digital and analog mean today? Let's, let's, let's restage the question um, first addressed through Masumi um, in light of this, this, this other um, part of the story. The digital can mean a number of different things. Uh, colloquially, uh, digital culture might refer to the computational, the new, the online. And today, digital culture has a special relationship, of course, to mass culture through uh, post-internet aesthetics, uh, cat videos, image macros, viral contagious media, social media and web 2.0, rhizomatic distributed networks, protocological organization, blockchain, and on and on. More specifically, we could say in a very, very, very direct sense, the digital refers to the digits, the mathematical digits, but also the digits of the body, the fingers and the toes. And through this, the digital really is indicating a kind of making discrete, a series of discrete points, periodic sampling, discontinuous representation, Right, and we're back to Masumi's, uh, the aforementioned zeros and ones. But I think the key action here is discretization or making discrete. The digital, you might say, is the capacity to divide things and make distinctions between them. For me, that's, that's, that's the key part of, part of the definition. It's the capacity to divide and make distinctions. Um, so it really does synchronize with this, uh, the ontologies of difference, I think, quite directly. And even just as an aside, I, I don't know if, if, if I've elaborated on this very much at all, but um, it strikes me that uh, the digital appears, because of this, to be quite explicitly a form of abstraction. So it would be very hard for me to think of a, a, a digital mode that does not entail a form of abstraction. Um, and we might even want to go so far as to say that the digital is abstraction as such. Um, and there's a whole kind of sub conversation we could have around compression and, and deletion and the forgetting of, of, of things um, through, through, through digitization. So now I'll speak very, very generally, kind of distilling some stuff I, I've done um, in, in written work. So I apologize, but I'm going to go through and, and present what I see as the four kind of key mechanisms for the digital. First, I think the digital follows the rule of two, the rule of two, in that it relies on an ever-present discretization into two or more, the two, the three, the multiple. Second, and stemming from the first, the digital relies on a homogeneous substrate of elements. So I was, I was getting at this a minute ago. A homogeneous substrate of elements that are differentiated quantitatively. And I would say the alphabet is just as relevant as, as let's say, the integers are. So 
A, B, C is a form of quantitative differentiation. So the famous zeros and ones are the ones that get the most attention, of course, but um, uh, the alphabet is just as digital. Um, the, rest of the, the rest of the numbers are just as digital. Uh, perhaps so is the genome. Uh, perhaps the rational number line as a whole, plus all other systems of mediation constructed from quantitative difference. So I don't make a distinction there, and I, I do not privilege zeros and ones or even um, numerical form of digitization. Third, the digital leverages its internal mechanisms, distinction, making discrete, this notion of a kind of embedded difference, to assemble combinatory holes. Examples of this combinatory mechanism um, are some of the examples I just gave a minute ago. The, the ratio numbers like three, three, three to four, three quarters, or five to eight, five eighths. Um, and you know, whole, no, whole numbers can also be represented in this form. Two is just two over one, right? Or simple words like cat and bat, uh, all words, in fact. Finally, fourth, out of these combinatory groups, the digital produces a sort of, uh, if you will, a kind of transcendental form of some kind, a transcendental essence that has some sort of symbolic power, which is to say something that supersedes the merely homogeneous substrates of elements. I think this is why discourse around sort of the ghost in the machine is so uh, is so common and, in fact, uh, relevant and, and accurate in a certain level. So turning now to the analog, it too has a colloquial significance that may or may not be important for us. Uh, colloquially, analog means the offline, the old, the real, the authentic, the richly aesthetic. More specifically, the analog, as we have seen, refers to continuous variation and indeed continuousness as such, right? Integration to the whole, proportion, comparison, correspondences, and qualitative similarity now. Hence, the analog is found most easily in curves and waves, in an aesthetic of smoothness and unbroken lines, planes, or volumes the mirror, the echo, the ghost, the trace, the outline. These are paradigmatic analog modes. Its materiality is water, liquidity, flow, or perhaps plastic with its molding and continuous variation. Plastic, but also metal, with metallurgical annealing as a kind of analogical liquefaction of matter Right? And Dillis and Guattari wrote about um, uh, metal. Um, so again, is this a form of abstraction? Uh, abstraction like the digital? I'm not so clear on this point. Um, I, I, I've tried to figure out what would, a, what would an analogical mode of abstraction be, and does it even exist? Um, I think the analog is not abstract if by abstraction we mean symbolic reduction. But um, maybe the, the Delizians in the room will, 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 will consider, um, we could consider a kind of strictly analogical mode of abstraction through the concept of the virtual, right? So if you remember the, the great example of the virtual in Deleuze, um, a curve, right, and then a, a tangent line. And maybe the tangent line is the abstraction of the curve. Or maybe we could even say, quite simply, ice is an abstraction of liquid water, and vice versa. An analog abstraction. Similar to the uh, previously itemized mechanisms for the digital, um, I think the analog may also be generalized into a series of movements or, or mechanisms. So again, I'm going through these very quickly. but. Um, I'd be happy to talk about them more. For me, the analog follows the rule of the one, meaning that it tends toward an integration from the multiple into the continuous. Or you might say that, that, that there has to be a notion of kind of the common or commonality at the, at the heart of analogicity. 
um, that, that uh, digitality does not have. Um, and I just want to flag this because whenever you use a word like the one, um, uh, it's important to, to qualify what you mean. Um, and, I, and I think it's important not to confuse this term with terms like um, the all or the whole or universality or totality. Okay? I think something like the common or the generic would be a better understanding of, of the one in this context. Second, the analog relies on a substrate where all elements are strictly heterogeneous to each other, which is to say they relate only through qualitative difference without recourse to any kind of abstract or symbolic infrastructure. So this is very, very Dulesian if you're fam familiar with, let's say, like the plane of eminence or kind of concepts like that. Thus, there is no such thing as an analog alphabet or an analog genome. That just doesn't make any sense. Third, the analog leverages qualitative transformations to generate real forms. And finally, the analog generates an identity, or we, we could say maybe an imminent relation. This identity is generated out of proportionality similarity or correspondence within the heterogeneous substrate. So even just, you know, when you're speaking, the vocal cords and the sound waves in the air are, are heterogeneous to each other. They're not the same. I don't think, you know, ontologically, physically, mechanically, they're not the same. Nevertheless, there is a, there is a, there is a, there's an analogical commonality um, from one to the other. Okay, so with all this in mind, I think we can maybe move beyond, if you will, the sort of consumer electronics definition of the digital analog. Um, and so I want to now speak a little bit more generally and then be sort of wildly irresponsibly uh, spect uh, speculative in, in, the, in the ending of the talk. Um, first, I think we can say that the digital doesn't mean zeros and ones, at least not exclusively or necessarily. That's just a kind of shorthand. If anything, it means ones and twos. The one dividing in two, and the two integrating as one. And again, when I say two, I mean two, three, four, multiple. And so perhaps we could just advance a small step in our thinking to advance from zero and one to one and two. Second, it's clear that digitality and analogicity, for me at least, are general modes of mediation. This, this may be obvious, but I think it's important to stress. They are not facts about hardware or consumer electronics, at least not only facts. Indeed, digitality and analogicity are free-floating aesthetic modes, you might say, evident in many different formats and times, perhaps in all of them. One does not need a computer to be digital. We know, you know mosaics are digital, musical notation is digital, Texts and textiles are digital, and on and on. Um, and here I will make an important caveat, which is I'm not saying we shouldn't do material semiotics. Um, that's my bread and butter. I'm totally committed to that. Um, nevertheless, I think we also have to have a more sophisticated um, conceptual understanding of the digital and the analog. So moving beyond this consumer electronics theory of the digital, a whole new landscape of digitality becomes visible. What now, then, are the greatest technologies of the digital? The logic gate and the computer are merely the latest in a long stream of digital technologies that would begin certainly with the integers, the alphabet, or even the atom, the synapse, the gene, the dialectic, and even the point itself in zero degrees, if not the line in one degree, or the plane in two, degree, two degrees. Surely these are the great technologies of digitality. Um, and I was joking the other day, some of you might remember um, Kandinsky's primer on, on drawing called point and line to plane. Um, and I was joking that it could have easily been titled digital and digital to digital. At the same time, 
To think beyond the consumer electronics theory of the digital liberates the analog as well. The analog is now not simply the vinyl record or the magnetic tape, but duration, intensity, sensation, affect. And we, 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 we learned this all from Deleuze, of course. All of those things, but also the wave, the gradient, the curve. Indeed, we might say um, that the analog is quite simply the real, but a real having been denuded of its romantic and nostalgic aura. The real without any logic of presence or absence, the real without the principle of norm and deviation. Here, the real is understood as a kind of fullness or plenum where representation, if representation is even a word that is available to us for the analog, um, is fully coextensive with, with reality. And so when I say that the, the analog is real, that's not to throw out mediation or some form of analogically appropriate theory of representation. I think the analog is a mode of, of mediation um, and, and what I'm trying to say here is that, uh, that if the analog is a mode of mediation, it, it is so while remaining within the real, right? So that's this idea of imminence. Okay, so now I wanna speak more generally about the analog, uh, particularly its relationship to theory and philosophy. So this is the kind of inside baseball half of the talk. Given the fact that the digital is, for all practical purposes, a synonym for logos, and I do think that is true, and given that logos has a special role in Western philosophy, it might seem that the analog is incompatible with philosophy, that there could be no such thing as an analog philosophy. In fact, analog philosophy does exist, even if it necessitates a reconfiguration of the basic conditions of philosophy. And I think that's one of the things that Deleuze um, accomplished in, in philosophy. So I'd like to propose a series of themes that seem to run through much contemporary writing in critical and cultural theory today, and which I would put under the heading of analog philosophy. So these are not people who write about the digital or write about the analog, but I'm suggesting in the way that they write and in the way that they think are in, in, in essence, analog thinkers. So a few different themes, and then I'll, I'll summarize them in a moment. The first theme, ironically or unexpectedly, I think comes from the legacy of post-structuralism, a kind of filtered or modified riff on the old post-structuralist language, language of gaps, traces, supplements, patchiness, mixing, messiness. These are still the virtues of the day. As Wendy Brown puts it in Undoing the Demos, we must attend to supplements, slippages, and to a world that, quote, does not fully cohere. Anna Singh has talked about patches and patchiness, as has Kathleen Stewart. Singh also connects this with the notion of entanglement, or what she calls a, quote, mosaic of open-ended assemblages of entangled ways of life. Patrick Jagoda, in his recent book on network aesthetics, describes, quote, a world that is messy, uncertain, in an attempt to show an ambivalent sensitivity to the riskiness and complicatedness inherent to all intimacies. For his part, Hiroki Azuma is concerned with an endless movement of slipping sideways. And in one of the most powerful sections of habeas viscous, Alexander Wialia evokes, quote, the sorrow songs, smooth glitches, minuscule movements, shards of hope, scraps of food, and interrupted dreams of freedom that already swarm the ether. 
Let's dwell in that language for a moment. Glitches, shards, scraps, interruptions, swarms. This is a very specific vocabulary. At the same time, identifying contemporary discourse and attention to something rather different, pragmatic concerns. From action and production to expression, creativity, performance, and experimentation. At play here is the old philosophical distinction between being and doing, the former a question of presence or existence, and the latter a question of will, event, or action. Recall when Deleuze confessed his desire to remove essences and to substitute events in their place. Now, nearly 50 years after Deleuze wrote that, it's not uncommon for a contemporary theorist to say that the being of an entity does not matter. What matters is the doing. As Benjamin Bratton recently put it, platforms are what platforms do. Jasper Puar says something similar about assemblages. Quote, there are thus numerous ways to define what assemblages are, but I am here more interested in what assemblages do. We may describe this approach, I think, as post or anti-hermeneutic in that it tends to focus more on function, performance, or even modeling rather than representation, mimesis, or meaning. We Leo agrees with this pragmatic turn as well, writing that, quote, assemblages are inherently productive, entering into polyvalent becomings to produce and give expression to previously non-existent realities, thoughts, bodies, affects, spaces, actions, ideas, and so on. In the beginning was the deed, wrote Goethe in an inversion of the, um, the, the gospel. At least for analog philosophy, that must be true. Indeed, all this doing is adding up. The shift from an existential to an ergodic analysis entails a concomitant shift in the general foundations of the world. So this new world is described often in terms of process, not stasis. Becoming is the order of the day, not being. In Jane Bennett's estimation, our ontology is, quote, a turbulent, imminent field in which various and variable materialities collide, congeal, morph, evolve, and disintegrate. Here, of course, we see the triumph of process philosophy overall and an indication of the immense influence that thinkers like Whitehead and Deleuze have had on contemporary thought. Um, and I think of this often as a kind of gerund sublime, right, in which becoming triumphs over mere existence. If the old mantra of leftist theory was always historicize, the new mandate for today has shifted to something more like always deterritorialize. And that distinction, of course, between being and becoming, between structure and genesis, is also one of the classic um, problems, questions in philosophy, um, which we could talk about more. Perhaps this accounts for the preponderance of assemblage theory in recent years. If the gerund sublime has taken over, if the world is populated by ergodic machines, and if they are indeed so messy, uncertain, slippery, and patchy, then it makes sense to, to, to migrate to that most useful structure, the assemblage. The assemblage is a good way to account for multiplicity and difference and to do it analogically. It's a good way to think beyond dualisms. With its internal heterogeneity, the assemblage allows us to move beyond things like objects or discrete entities and think instead in terms of forces, fields, and networks. <clears throat> 
So as I've been hinting, I think much of this kind of analog turn that I'm describing may be summed up in terms of a very particular debate within materialism, within, within the, the discourse on materialism. Bennett puts it in stark terms when she admits that she, quote, pursues a materialism in the tradition of Democritus, Epicurus, Spinoza, Diderot, Deleuze, more than Hegel, Marx, Adorno. So if you look at those two rosters, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's pretty clear. Um, the Deleuzean strain stems from a tradition of what we, what we might call radical materialism. God or nature was Spinoza's famous formulation. While the other tradition puts the dialectic at its center, that is the cycles of negation, estrangement, and alterity, but also their resolution perhaps through expression, realization, and an encounter with the other. The analog philosophers believe that the world at its core is nothing but consistency and accident. Consistency and accident. They believe, following Elizabeth Gross, that the world is made up of, and I love this phrase, little shards of chaos. Little shards of chaos. They conceive of matter as essentially, as essentially aleatory, a word borrowed from the Latin meaning a throw of dice. For the analog philosophers, there is no destiny or fate, but so too no overweening will or conscious determination. Instead, there is primarily chaos, contingency, chance, and spontaneous accident. Um, and in fact, in, 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 kind of, um, in kind of homage to the, the notion of the clinamen or swerve in Lucretius, um, I, I, with my students, I've, I've, I've started calling this group of thinkers the swervers. OK, so just to kind of collate and summarize the, this, this description that I just tried to make about the state of analog philosophy today, I could collate it under, under five headings. Analog aesthetics means gaps, patchiness, messiness, slippages. Analog ethics means doing, action, production, creativity, experimentation, pragmatism. Analog ontology means becoming, process, deterritorialization. Analog relationality means assemblage, multiplicity, qualitative difference. And analog causality means chance, accident, chaos. But we could also maybe even add you know, consistency and, and territorialization. So what are the consequences of the analog turn in theory? I will mention um, two things quickly before dwelling on a third consequence. Um, I identified the first item already, that this is a new kind of materialism. And you all probably heard of this expression, um, new materialism. Um, but let's be clear, this, this new materialism has specific qualities. A Lucretius revival, a Deleuzean hegemony, and the almost entirely uh, complete elimination of, of Marx. The second item has only been hinted at, um, but I think it's clear that analog philosophy is also concurrent with the ethical turn in theory, which in my reading entails a, a kind of uh, a waning of the political, you might say, at the same time. And there's a lot of people in this tradition who very explicitly make that distinction and say that they're participating in, in ethical theory and not in political theory. In fact, several details reveal a close consistency between analog philosophy and a theory of ethics. So we could talk about things like a mutual attention to materiality, um, the discarding of morality and, meta and metaphysics, um, or even this notion of the law of the one, the rule of, 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 of one, which I think um, is, is at work in both ethical theory um, as well as in the analog. So analog philosophy is a new kind of materialism, and it tends to turn ethics into first philosophy 
Uh, but we could also say, and I don't have time to really go into this, but it also tends to turn aesthetics into first philosophy. And you, you can even hear that in some of the passages that I quoted. Um, and you, sometimes you can even use this as a litmus test. If you find a, a thinker who wants to make ethics and or aesthetics first philosophy, um, we might have an analog philosopher on our hands. Not always, but it's, it's a good indicator. We might return to the work of Elizabeth Gross, who displaces classical metaphysical models in favor of a uh, unapologetically analog philosophy rooted in ethics and aesthetics. Quote, in the beginning is chaos, she wrote in her Wellick lectures from 2007. The whirling, unpredictable movement of forces, vibratory oscillations that constitute the universe. Indeed, the resulting book, Chaos, Territory, Art, Deleuze, and the Framing of the Earth, was an attempt to think art in strictly ontological terms. And uh, in a very recent book, The Incorporeal, Gross presents an analog philosophy through the lens of ethics. So if you're interested in pursuing either of these um, tracks, I could recommend uh, both of those texts. It would take more time to prove definitively, but here, even in this simple discussion, I want to suggest two things. One, through some of these, these, these things I've been quoting, I think there does exist a general consensus today around um, a number of different strands that certainly are very, very different from each other, but certainly, I think, fall under this heading of, of the analog, whether that be Deleuze, Whitehead, even figures like Latour, Stengers, New Materialism, from Masumi, Manuel Delanda, to Bennett and Gross, some people I've quoted and some people I, I haven't quoted, and many, many other people. So that's the, that's the first kind of observation, and then the second part of the observation is that this broad consensus is rooted in an analog way of thinking, not a digital way of thinking. So if this is true, and I'm, it may not be true, and you can, you can tell me why. Um, what kind of larger consequences come from it? So for instance, could, could, we, could we periodize the heyday of digital thinking? Could we periodize the heyday of analog thinking? Consider the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and this kind of high, high watermark of post-structuralism. Consider the age of écriture, of Jean-Joseph Gou, and the theory of symbolic economies in Freud and Marx. Consider the notion that there is nothing outside of the text. Right? Could, you, could you imagine a more, uh, more digital assertion? There is nothing outside of the text. This, to me, represented peak digitality, at least from within the recent past. By contrast, consider the mid-1990s through to today the shift into full-fledged Deleuzeanism that began in the 1990s in the English-speaking world, the triumph of radical empiricism, this new wave of, of so-called new materialism, the triumph really of pragmatic methods, at least in my just kind of anecdotal observations, um, even the various arguments that are more and more common today against method, um, we could talk more about that, um, also, perhaps in a very different way with movements like speculative realism, if you, if you followed that, or even a figure like Francois Laruelle, who I've written on. Or even those of you who are familiar with the debates in literary criticism, the, the, the kind of how we read now debates, um, I think themselves uh, engage in this um, uh, directly, mostly because it's a movement away from hermeneutics and, and, and critique. To me, this represents this kind of peak analogicity, the golden age of analog. Interestingly, um, I just saw a, a new essay by Benjamin John Boyson where he refers to this kind of analog philosophy as semiophobia, the, the fear of signs, the fear of meaning making. Um, we could call it maybe a fear of the symbolic, a fear of the logos and the meaning it bears. And I think this is, this is um, a way of characterizing contemporary theory. Um, and I'm not advocating a return to logocentrism. So um, 
so I, we could debate this all night, but, but let me end with a few um, kind of general, so this is the wildly irresponsible uh, uh, speculative portion, um, uh, just to kind of segue into um, you know, uh, our, our, our conversation here. Um, so it strikes me, if, if we buy into this periodization of peak digitality, peak analogicity, I think what's interesting is that it, it, it doesn't map onto the normal consumer electronics narrative. It actually, oppos it's, it's exactly opposite to that narrative. It breaks the narrative, which I think is really interesting. So time-wise, history-wise, peak analog overlaps uncannily with the invention and adoption of Web 1.0 in, in the, in the mid-late mid, late 90s, which is typically characterized as a kind of you know, digital revolution. So I think we have a contradiction between the material infrastructure and the kinds of discourse that's being produced um, in and around it. And it's, it's almost, I mean, to, be, to put it in very crass terms, it's almost as if theorists consciously headed the other direction once the computers showed up. At the same time, if peak digitality, I mean, remember, Masumi's on the superiority of the analog. It was written, was conceived and written and published um, at that moment in the, in the late 90s. At the same time, if peak digitality happened in the 1960s or 70s, then the industrial infrastructure doesn't so much overlap with theoretical and cultural production, or this, this micro niche of, of cultural production, but lag behind it by a couple of decades. Indeed, this was an all too common sentiment in theory of the mid 90s, some of you might remember um, you know, Arthur and Mary Louise Croker, uh, George Landau, even, even magazines like Mondo 2000. Um, the notion was really that, you know, we already had digitality in philosophy, right? We had Derrida's difference, we had Baudrillard's hyperreal, we even had in this, I think, misreading of Deleuze, Deleuze's virtuality, right? This was, this was part of the argument at the time. And so if we had that, so now it would be possible to have digitality in mass media as well through virtual reality, through hypertext, hypercard, cyberpunk, all the kind of thrills of, of hard post-modernity. So I used to argue that, um, you know, kind of the internet killed theory, or at least stifled it for a short period of time. But I think maybe I missed a, a key sort of zigzag or wrinkle in the story. Because I think uh, the Croker's, Landau, et cetera, were, really were right on the question of the digital. The internet was an extension of 60s and 70s era theory. It was the analog reaction to computation that put theory into the crisis that it experienced right around the turn of the millennium. Okay, so that's one just kind of observation. Another interesting contradiction. Much of what comes under the heading of new materialism and speculative realism is explicitly anti-digital in its aims and claims while at the same time burnishing its credentials as a born digital philosophical movement. So you'll hear often like it's a, it's a, speculative realism is the first philosophical movement to exist and grow on the, in, um, in the blogosphere. So I think there's a kind of interesting performative contradiction here. Um, and again, I'm, I'm reducing a ton of different people into a, a, you know, an umbrella heading, but I think it's def defendable. Um, so there's a kind of performative contradiction. If contemporary theory, think about it, if, if it were in fact born digital or pro-digital or digital centric, then forget about blogging, we'd need something a bit more serious, I think. We would need an explicit rejection of Deleuze and a rejection of Whitehead, a rejection of Simondon, a rejection of Latour and Stengers. And in fact, an endorsement of those very digital technologies that I have been referring to all along, an endorsement of textuality, an endorsement of the symbolic order, an endorsement of semiotic abstraction, an endorsement, in fact, of correlation, um, which is, if you follow the speculative realist stuff, you know is at the very heart of that, um, of that, of that, of that discourse. We would need a return, in fact, to classic metaphysical models and a rejection of the flat ontologies that are so popular today. A rejection of imminence is what we would need. We would need even maybe a return to the dialectic. I think you see, you see my point here. Um, but there's very little evidence of that happening in, in these kinds of um, 
schools, contemporary schools, new materialism, speculative realism. And finally, the last kind of just sort of, you know, observation here, and I don't really know what this all is going to mean for us, but just as an observation. I think, in fact, this puts us on a collision course with some of the most advanced contemporary thinking on technology and digitality. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean the tradition of tech writing that begins with figures like Simondon and Deleuze and continues through contemporary figures like Bernard Stiegler, Yuk Hui, Adrian McKenzie, Stephen Shaviro, Mark Hansen, people who are kind of working directly in the legacy of, of Simondon and Deleuze. So I think that this tradition of tech writing, um, which again is not, of course, the only discourse available, but I think it's a very important and significant one. The tr this tradition of tech writing that begins with um, Simondon and Deleuze is characteristically, if also not also inescapably analogical. And thus, I think we have a preponderance of writing on computation and digitality from theorists who are already, if you will, biased in favor of the analog. Now, that doesn't mean they can't do interesting work, but I do think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question to ask. Deleuze, of course, had many smart things to say about the symbolic, about language, about sense, um, about abstraction even. Um, but I think I would want to say that his entire body of work is one massive assault on digital philosophy. I would thus contend that any serious theory of the digital might want to think twice before beginning in that place. And maybe a serious theory of the digital must tackle the symbolic order directly, like the thing that nobody wants to talk about, right? It has to begin with difference. It has to begin with abstraction. It has to begin with negation, with discretization itself. These are all the technologies of the digital. Okay, so I'm presenting a, a, a kind of a polemic here, and, and I hope you understand that this is not to, as it were, defend digitality against the encroachment of analog philosophy. Um, and I just wrote a book that tried to imagine with, with La Ruella's chaperone a way of thinking that in fact was either against the digital or you know, a way of thinking that didn't have digitality or analogicity at all in it. Um, still, I suspect that today, given this context, it's time to turn our attention back again directly to the digital. For that is the site of the event, of negation, of breaking with the present state of affairs. Indeed, I anticipate a turn away from the ethical and back to the political, which is to say, back to the spirit of the age. So I look forward to discussing this with you. Thank you very much. I have a question. I'm, I'm totally, you've thought much more about this than I have. And it was interesting. But I do have a question. I, um, I'm not sure I agree with the, the, with the binary implicit in your discussion. Um, because... For example, you said the atom is is um, is digital. I think you said that at one point. Heisenberg indeterminacy principle is at the heart of the digital. That reflects your whole description of the of the analog. Everything you describe the analog as is a reflection of Heisenberg indeterminacy theory. So I don't see that there's a disconnection there at all. Yeah. And in fact, when you talked about DNA. Not being, um, not having a uh, an analog capability, mm -hmm. RNA is an analog of DNA coming directly out of it. Yeah. So I don't understand uh, the problem here, as yeah. you know, the way you set it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I I should have said maybe more about this, but I I do think that um, you know my students and I often talk about this. The, the time where you think you've identif identified the most kind of digital phenomena or whatever, you will see analogicity there. Totally and the time when you think you've identified the most analogical phenomena, you will see digitality there. Right? right. So, so consider the wave, this, 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 the sine wave, right? Like the paradigmatic digital for, uh, analogical form, the sine wave. 
peaks, troughs, frequency, right? So there is a way of, 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 of dividing up and discretizing the wave. So I, 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 I agree with you that this is a kind of analytical frame. And that implication is strong because yeah. when you start, uh, when you, it seems to me that at the core of what a lot of writers today are doing with the digital is worrying about um, the, the interconnection between chaos and materialism, mm -hmm. if you want to put it that way. How do you work in a shard world yeah. where labor uh, becomes a very different form of labor than it was previously? So it's an attempt to blend a kind of Marxism with a kind of broken kind of uh, prism, yeah. how that works. So the two are, I think people are seeing both at the same time. Yeah, yeah I would agree with you. Yeah, yeah, and we could, so we can, we can try to separate them analytically. Um, and, and in fact, I think a lot of the people that I'm quoting are quite polemical on this point, and they will put the digital aside. <laughs> they will the put business, the digital That's aside. how business works. Yeah. Um, you know, also, it's, it's, it's unclear to me, like, you know, because I've thought a lot about the examples of, you know, you know, the photon. Is it analog? Is it digital? Right. Well, it's probably both. Um, or as you say, you know, uh, things start to peter out at this kind of subatomic level. Um, some of some contemporary theorists have used this as a as a as a as a as a kind of inspiration, right? So meditating on superposition, um, the quantum principle of superposition. Lara Lowe has written on that. Um, Karen Barad is interested in some of these issues. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. I'd, I'd have to think more about it. Um, yeah. Um, this is kind of related to the previous question. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as you mentioned, your, um, the, the universe of, of discourse from which you were drawing is Anglo-American and, and French and Western philosophy. And, but um, would it look any different if we step outside this you know the the, uh, the Western world. I'm I'm thinking you know the distinct the, when you when you say that an alphabet is digital. I'm thinking of Chinese, mm -hmm. and I, I remember uh, reading somewhere um, recently that um, even though you have you know uh, uh, the, the Chinese idiolects, you know they are the kind of an, an analogical representation of the world. Arguably, you know the, uh, uh, I, I don't I don't understand Chinese, so I'm, I'm, I might be I might be completely wrong, but digital technology now enables a kind of recombination where you, you know, tease apart the constituent parts of the letters and you, instead of having these gigantic typewriters, you, your sort of yeah. typesetting becomes much more, much more easy in the digital yeah. world. So there's kind of this blurring between digital, that the distinction seems to somehow kind of break apart when you think of something like Chinese as opposed to a Western alphabet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not an I'm not an expert in the area, but I think that um, I think language is digital. I don't think there is analogical language, and um, and I think the example of a more kind of pictographic alphabet um, may complicate the story, may make the, the the alphabet much larger, make the window of of inquiry much larger or different in some way, um, but you know, the Chinese alphabet is in Unicode. You know, it's a uh, it, it's, it's a digital system, you know, or at least it is for all practical purposes a digital system. Um, but that's a good point, and, and, and I do think there would be, um, that there's a lot of room for latitude to think about different, different um, versions of this. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I tend to think digitally rather than analogically, so, um, yeah. <clears throat> it feels like with the last two questions, that the problem of the consumer electronics messy model can be extended to subatomic physics or linguistic analogies. Like you're trying to build these kind of cluster concept clouds, not word clouds, around analog and digital, and you're recognizing, even as you spoke, that they're they're kind of messy. Yeah. But the harder line of your argument seems to have to do with the Jane Bennett two lines of philosophy: Hegel, Marx, Adorno versus mm -hmm. yeah. Spinoza, Whitehead, and especially Deleuze and yeah, I'm assuming. <clears throat> so what I wanted to ask about that is it, it felt like the historicizing of thought moment towards the end gave us 
the high hermeneutic of the high theory moment, which is to say psychoanalysis plus post-structuralism plus Marxism, is digital thinking. And when you're worried about analog thinking, you want us, I think, to be worried too. And a year ago, you didn't want that to mean a flip back to the dialectic. Um, but now today, maybe you do. I guess my question is both political and technical. The political part is, why didn't you want it then? It seems like everything, including the use of the word analog reaction, um, yeah. points something political in you in that direction. And the technical question is just about the dialectic, if the dialectic is a digital mode of thought. Have you spent like a half an hour at some point thinking about how the core of the dialectic, like that is to say the conversion process that Hegel yeah. describes as running counter to the kind of homogeneity of tiles, as it were, in, in digital thinking, which is to say thesis, antithesis, synthesis seems to feel analogical. And I, I preface it all by saying I don't want to just be the third person being like everything that looks yeah. like tiles is actually no. curves. But No, that's a super interesting question. And um, I mean, the di I, I'd have to think much longer than a half an hour on the dialectic. But, um, and you know you might you might know that there was you know at a time there was like a you know a, a death match between the the people who thought the dialectic at its core was about um, synthesis and the people who thought the dialectic at its core or essence was about um, was about opposition and negation. Right? I forget it was like the the Soviets came down on one side and the Chinese came down on another. I can't remember which side was which. But, um, um, so. Of course, I'm not a Hegelian, but the hardcore Hegelians would come and they would say, no, everything that you're looking for is there in the dialectic. Because if you're looking for heterogeneity in the dialectic, uh, if you're looking for heterogeneity, it's in the dialectic, meaning there is no, there is no uh, better form of absolute otherness than what the dialectic is able to, to you know, the, the, the kinds of absolute otherness that the dialectic reveals that's that you know. So the Hegelians would say that, and I just I think of it really as much more um, a kind of s symbolic operation or or an operation that is meant to um, produce and generate a symbolic order, um, whether that's mind or spirit or whatever you want to call it, right? And so that production of the symbolic order to me wins out maybe over this kind of you know encounter with with the other that's at the heart of the dialectic, which may be m much more analogical. Um, I also think, and here's my kind of Deleuzian training, I also think if you have negation, you're doing digitality, right? There is no negation in Deleuze. I mean, or in 99.9% .9 of Deleuze, it's all affirmation, no negation, all affirmation, affect, intensity, extensity. It, it's just thermodynamics, right? It's, High pressure zones over here, low pressure zones over there. That's all it is. Things moving around. And I think when you have strong negation, that's, that's, a, different, that's a different approach. And so that's why I would kind of put that on the digital side. But, but you're right. It's all mixed up and, and confused. And uh, yeah. Well, I'm question is kind of following from some of these. Sure. I'm a philosopher. So what I'm questioning really is the characterization of this being philosophical theory. It seems, as you had mentioned, that right, like this is the theory of the blogosphere, et cetera, speculative realism. Which is just a cheap shot. But right, yeah, totally. And it makes sense, right? But like, isn't, isn't it the case that it's precisely the theory of the blogosphere, but not actually mainstream institutional philosophy? Yeah. It's a very marginal section yeah, yeah. of that, that philosophical yeah. discourse. And so what's interesting is there's, if we frame it differently, how do we think about okay. the analog so and the digital? Yeah. There's a whole host of discussions in contemporary theory, be it artificial intelligence, yeah. artificial life, computationalism, or even the history of cyberneticists, which is realistically mainstream Anglo-American philosophy. And we're looking at a much more kind of compartmentalized subset yeah. of that discipline that's really structured around a couple of different presses. Yeah, that's true. Right? And, and, and in that sense, we seem to be kind of vacillating back and forth between a very Kantian problem of discretization or 
continuity, right? It's one of the antinomies. Yeah, yeah. And so resolving issues of the digital and the digital and the analog juxtaposition seems that maybe what we're operating with is like a hazy concept of what the digital is given its potentially totalizing discourse. Mm -hmm. And that it's helpful to think about the work that's done in these other traditions, yeah. which would be parsing through an analysis of what information looks like yeah. from a semantic or a syntactic or a pragmatic sense. Right. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if the way that you've characterized the I'm wondering if the way that you've characterized this, um, what I'm calling a subset of philosophical theory, yeah. is kind of strawmanning their lack of a distinction about that Kantian antinomy, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So whether it be in, in Marx or in Deleuze or in Badu, I know the way that you frame it in terms of Deleuze as no negation and Badu as a subtractive and La Ruelle as something other, but within that discourse, yeah. it seems to be that there's a lot of other kind of structurally analogous La Ruelians. Oh, interesting. Does that make sense? I, I know I've yeah, I mean, around a, a bunch of... But it, but it sounds like you're, you're then suggesting that this, that this discourse is analog philosophy. The, the hazy definition, the, 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 the lack of a desire to cleanly differentiate between discretization and continuity. Um, so maybe we're agreeing. Yeah, I mean, I think that I agree with you in terms of some of the characterizations of the tendencies, yeah. but it's like when we frame it around this antinomy, right, yeah. a Kantian antinomy of is the world discrete or is the world continuous? And we think about maybe those antinomies are poorly formulated questions uh -huh. and following mathematical structuralism or, you know, bad do. If we can formulate the problem, it has a solution. Right. So setting them up as kind of poorly formulating this issue of the digital yeah. might be either uncharitable yeah. or, or maybe not, um, not faithful to the discourse. Yeah. yeah. And I think that what you're getting at is that you know, it, there is a digital, a pro-digital bias, right? I mean, formulate the problem. Uh, right now, you know, we're, we're doing stuff on AI this week in my seminar, um, Hubert Dreyfus's classic book, you know, What, what Computers Can't Do, uh, an argument that he won, in fact, um, and that book is all about the problem of what it means to formalize things, right? And I think that, to me, is, is the problem of the digital. Um, but that's also, lang that's the problem of language, that's the problem of thinking, um, yeah. Yeah, another question? Yeah. Thanks for your talk. Um, forgive some sort of like after network theory playfulness for a second. <laughs> but like, from the perspective of the technology, is life better or worse if it's digital versus analog? So like, from the Sundial's perspective, like, if we want to assign it some agency, like, is it better? Does it, the Sundial want to be analog? That's a really good question. Does the world, is there naturally forming digitality in the world? Yeah, I think that's a tough question, mostly because um, I think that, and here again I'll be very, you know, reductive and do a lot of violence to the disciplines, but I, I do think that, um, you know, the rationalist disciplines tend to think about things and think about the world very differently from empirical the empirical disciplines. And so I think it's hard, and you know, Deleuze was, a, was an empiricist, Latour is, is, has a great admiration for the tradition of radical empiricism. Um, and so I think it's very hard to, to kind of think through that set of initial conditions to know actually like what the frickin' world is, right? Um, because what we know about the world really comes from empiricists. Um, people who are dedicated to allowing the world to speak on its own terms without abstracting it. But the Louis right? isn't interested in the sundial being a sundial, like the end result. He's only interested in its becoming sundial. Like this, the Louis isn't interested, I mean, he, he's interested in the process of, of getting there. So I think yeah. the interesting thing for me about wondering about our technologies, this or that, is sort of like, 
the from a Deleuzian standpoint, sort of the the almost I don't know disinterest in that yeah. in that end result, and rather yeah. and so categories yeah. as a whole are sort of like and then the but those things then come back in a different form, right? So. You know, Deleuze doesn't particularly want to talk in the classic kind of semiotic terms, but then he'll write a book like Logic of Sense, right, at the height of the, you know, first wave of post-structuralism as a way to, strictly through analog methods, you know, give an account for language, meaning, sense, nonsense, all of the terms that semiotics and structuralism at the time were obsessed with, right? So. I don't know, I've, I have great admiration for that, uh, for that undertaking, but I feel like there's no escaping the fact that even when he addresses quote unquote digital topics, he does from the perspective of analog philosophy. Does that make sense? So I don't know, I, that's a tough question, I, and I don't, I don't know how to <laughs> answer it. I think what Deleuze would say is, yes, objects crave things, or, or, or objects have certain propensities or affordances. So maybe we could go to that kind of tradition in media studies. Yeah. So, so two questions. One related to the Deleucian hegemony and new materialisms. Yeah. Um, and the second one related to um, what you, I, I think you hit right on point, the, a more ethical intervention rather than a political intervention that you get much out yeah. of, much yeah, of yeah. new materialisms. On the first part, um, so on the one hand, I, I'm with you that there is a rather do this in hegemony in, in new materialism. But there's also uh, a line of work, particularly, I mean, you mentioned Broad, um, mm -hmm. who was very much of a deconstructionist of Deridian, yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, as well as Vicki Kirby. In fact, Vicki Kirby's book, Quantum Anthropologies, mm -hmm. is actually trying to take up Derrida and bring Derrida back into discourse mm -hmm. um, and really trying to rethink deconstruction within the context and discourse of, of new materialism. Yes. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I'm wondering about, you know, how you might think about, um, on the one hand, yes, Barab, but in, especially Kirby's project that's really thinking deconstruction in, in new materialisms, and even going back to uh, Derrida's first text on a deconstruction of, of Husserl's uh, uh, the phenomenology of, of geometry. Uh, the geometry, yeah, the yeah. Of geometry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then the second yeah. question regarding the political interventions. Um, so you mentioned Wahilier and Pouar. Yeah. And these are the two especially that I would say are departures from the more ethical interventions of new materialism. Actually, I'm making yeah. an argument yeah. for yeah. more socio-political so interventions. Yeah. I agree. Um, and in fact, especially Wahilier is actually critiquing much of post-humanist discourse for yeah. doing an erasure of yeah. black literary feminist studies in the ways in which they've interrogated the very category of the, of the human. Um, uh, and really trying to bring these very discourses back into question, back into, into, into the project of what, what are the ways in which socio-political interventions in particular can be, can be brought to bear in new materialism. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And, and you're right, I mean, that section of the talk, um, you know, certainly made it sound like I was just lumping all those people together and, and, um, and there are important distinctions to be made. Mostly because I think, um, you know, a book like Habeas Viscus, it's not clear that that's a digital philosophy or an analog philosophy, you know? And I think, this is, this is why I was so interested in La Roelle, is that it, it, originally, is that he offered for me a way to kind of break out of this binarism. Um, and I think in a lot of critical race theory, um, you know, a lot of critical race theory is directly addressing binarisms presence, absence, you know, opposition. But I also think there's an important um, kind of way of reading that work where it's really about some category that actually is not accountable, um, whether that's flesh mm -hmm. in habeas viscous um, or something else. Um, yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Right, flesh is not analogical. Right. Right. Like the, my student reminded me, you know, the, what is the first chapter in um, Wilderson's book is called The Ruse of Analogy. <laughs> Analogy doesn't work <laughs> for blackness, right? Yeah. Um, I'm interested in like the, the little nod you gave at the end <clears throat> towards how digital and analogical uh, discourse might inform 
debates in literary studies over like surface reading limits of critique, <laughs> things like that, um, and how it might relate to your like jumping off point about Mount Analog, which I really want to read now. Um, I was kind of wondering why you might maybe you might speak a little bit about why you chose to start with Mount Analog, how that informs your like mm. understanding of these terms, and I was also wondering if when you ask what you pose as like an impossible question of what would an analogical abstraction look like. Mm. I wonder if perhaps the novel might be that, or yeah. if we can speak of the novel as a, as a technology, because I feel like I should pose it in these terms, yeah. as a technology or a form, or does it contain digital elements or analogical elements? Um, and finally, if, if the novel is technological, is, pardon, is analogical, <laughs> so many logicals, that's good. Um, how does that factor into your kind of advocacy of a turn towards the digital? Should we stop reading novels? Uh, <laughs> to put it cliffly. Um, Very interesting, important questions. Um, and of course, here at Penn, you have people who are who are doing a lot of interesting work right in this area. Um, Heather Love is one of the people who is most engaged in the sort of how we read now discussion. Um, and I should also mention Kaja Silverman is the one who's probably written the most on um, recently on um, analogy. Uh, her her recent book on photography. And even the one before that, too, Flesh, Flesh of My Flesh, where she's, she's basically said, which is pretty gutsy, I think, to say, you know, we should stop talking about difference and start talking about analogy. Um, so I guess my reference to the, the, the literary critical discussions today is really just um, maybe fairly superficial, right? Like just trying to understand what it, what it means to, like the desire to not do hermeneutics anymore and what that desire is all about. And oftentimes that desire is, um, even to call it a desire is sort of like revealing the answer, right? Um, that it's a desire that's really interested in a much more strictly aesthetic, oftentimes a much more strictly aesthetic, um, descriptive language of sensation, affect, Right. Um, I mean, there's even a way to think about the whole kind of like empirical and cognitive turn that has touched literary literary circles as well. Right. As a as a move away from kind of strong digitality toward um, these these research methods that are really about about I hate to use such moral language, but kind of like turning off um, the symbolic or turning off, you know, it's that semiophobia thing, right? You're turning off um, meaning making, meaning assigning, meaning absorption, you know. Um, so I don't know. Th those are the thoughts I have. I mean, I, I'm not, I think we should read novels, yeah, um, if that's the question. <laughs> um, but I do think, you know, langu you know, language is digital, not exclusively, but that seems to be an extremely important part. Nevertheless, we are digital and analogical creatures. And so our engagement with art and with novels um, has a linguistic component, but it also has a component that is rooted in all those great Deleuzean notions of intensity, affect, sensation, right? The, the kind of more aesthetic categories. Um, so maybe it's just a very traditional observation <laughs> you know, about art. Um, my observation was maybe more just about the field and like how it's changing. And that might be a great point to you know, talk if we can give Alex another thanks. Thank you.